Just to make sure that all of you guys know, all of the speakers, especially the ones in track one, two, and three, the heralds take the speakers directly over to the media cafe so that you can sit down, have a nice relaxing conversation with them, avoid journalists, different things like that. And speaking of journalists, how many members of the press do we have with us this evening? Members of the press. Members of the press. This is a very important announcement. Please do not, do not photograph, do not record, do not take video, do not in any way make a record of this event through any medium whatsoever. Um, we, we have people that have been uh, hired by the organization to document the event. You will be able to get any kind of media that you need for your news organizations from those people. But I have to make this absolutely and explicitly clear. There is to be absolutely no recording of this event whatsoever. You guys got that? So can you take pictures during this event? OK, one more time. Can you take pictures during this event? OK, everybody who said yes, that was really funny. But the real answer to that question is, I, I can't. OK, we, we, only have, we, we only have one minute. So let's get this done really, really quickly. Can you take pictures during this event? No. Can you take video during this event? No. <laughs> Can you help the press take any kind of recordings of this event? No. OK, have we all got that clear? Everybody's understanding the rules? Yes, yes, we understand the rules that there is no recording whatsoever. Are you guys ready? Dramatic pause. Dramat no, no. Shh, shh, shh. You guys ready? Here is Julian Assange. Thank you. Hello, Ohm. Can you hear me? Yes, they can hear you. They can hear, but I can't hear you. Can you hear us? Oh, there you go. Hello, Ohm. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 All right. <laughs> Great. Thank you. It's nice to be with you this evening. Uh, please excuse <coughs> uh, my reducing my political attack surface with this attire but I assure you that's what it's about, unlike perhaps some future uh, Hollywood movies to be released uh, in October. It is quite a clear uh, conscious decision to reduce the tax surface. Now, I heard just before um, uh, I came on uh, something about not recording video, not taking photos. I don't know why that is. Uh, just in case someone attributes it to me, it's not attributed to me. Um, I think, I, having dealt with a lot of these things, I understand at home why uh, you would not want people to run around videoing people or, or photo photographing them. But here we have a, an honour system uh, where only the honourable uh, are penalised uh, and the dishonourable uh, therefore have increased uh, profit due to the increased uh, scarcity of um, uh, material uh, being made available. So I would advise that the organizers uh, try and uh, change that, although I understand why you might want to put uh, strictures on uh, the big commercial media. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to try this evening to uh, not speak for too long uh, and have mostly questions. Uh, we all find people uh, who speak at length, I think, uh, rather boring. Uh, I've said what I've said many times, uh, and even I start to find myself boring after a while. Uh, so I'll just elucidate some points and then hope uh, that most of those are taken up in questions. Um, today, uh, or yesterday rather, uh, Bradley Manning uh, was 
convicted of 19 um, uh, offences, uh, five uh, espionage charges. Um, he is now in his sentencing phase, which started today. Uh, he is up for 136 uh, years. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to begin, if you like, uh, with the enemy's uh, talking points. Of course, uh, the treatment of Bradley Manning uh, comes about as a result of an attempt uh, to terrorize everyone, uh, to set a general deterrent. Uh, and to a degree, that works. But you see in the case of Edward Snowden, actually, there is kind of a self uh, delegitimization that also occurs uh, when a powerful organization uh, breaks uh, its own stated rules and acts in an inhumane uh, and immoral manner. Why is it so concerned about showing that it is inhumane? Well, power defines itself through its own exceptionality, its ability to not follow uh, its own rules that it has carried out, and the desire to display uh, power and to display exceptionality uh, is extremely high in this case and a number of other ones. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, because uh, the uh, transnational security state, principally involving the Anglo-Saxon nations, but also uh, well worked into NATO states, uh, feels threatened. And I think that's a very important signal uh, that that alliance does in fact feel threatened uh, as a result uh, of um, information about its true activities uh, emerging before the public. Uh, I think the degree of impact from the example uh, is probably well in excess of the degree of impact uh, from most uh, of the material in these cases. Uh, why, for example, has the United States uh, gone after Cuba for so long? Um, it's only a small country, it's really not that significant. Uh, but it is very significant as an example, uh, an example of successful uh, defiance. And WikiLeaks as an organization is an example of a very successful uh, defiance. Uh, Bradley Manning, according to his own statement, uh, is a a very important example of moral defiance against an immoral authority. As that case uh, proceeds, I think we need to un understand that, uh, that the efforts being placed against Bradley Manning, uh, and I suppose against WikiLeaks, uh, and even myself, uh, while on the one hand they might give you pause because you don't want to become uh, someone in a similar position. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we should understand that the amount of effort uh, being put into uh, persecuting uh, that young man and WikiLeaks organization really represent an uh, economic and political signal about the degree uh, of impact that we are, ha we are having. One of the um, unfortunate perceptual biases that come uh, from dealing with anonymous sources is it's only the, ever the ones that are no longer anonymous uh, that are spoken about. Um, whereas, in fact, the uh, overwhelming um, majority, uh, nearly all uh, sources uh, are successfully <coughs> anonymous. They uh, engage in effectively in a conflict and endure uh, campaign of one disclosure after another, but of course we don't perceive them. Um, we only perceive the ones who are given elevated uh, status uh, by principally the national security state. Uh, and in rushing to their defense as a symbol, of course all of us, and I am guilty of this as well, uh, elevate them uh, further still into the, to the public awareness, such that the message of terror um, is amplified by us uh, and by our opponents uh, pretty much in the same direction. So I think it's quite important to uh, work against uh, that kind of epistemological um, problem when, when looking at sources. Uh, now, 
Um, I want to pull back uh, for a moment and try and look down on where we're currently at. Um, the number of things that WikiLeaks has been involved in, that I have been involved in, uh, over the past, I think it's four uh, years uh, since uh, I was uh, uh, in the Netherlands, um, is, is so tremendous uh, and has so many facets that it's quite hard, I think, for most people uh, to glimpse uh, what is going on. But if we uh, remove ourselves a degree, um, we can see that, uh, and I hope it's, it's increasingly apparent now after Snowden's revelations, that we are facing a new Western religion. Uh, and that new Western religion is the national security state. Uh, it's hurtling towards a dystopia. Uh, it is dragging many of us along with it, uh, not combatants, but all of those who use the internet are sucked up into this system. And anyone who doesn't, of course, is economically, in terms of information flow, sucked into those who do. That system, that international complex of information flow and relationships uh, in the deep state uh, is the single largest problem uh, that global humanity faces uh, other than its own ignorance. We can understand that it is becoming a new religion, it is becoming a new uh, structure under which all the other structures are adhered to. Um, to understand that, uh, that there exists a state within a state, a, uh, a cult within the culture. Um, just look at the United States with now five million, uh, over five million security clearances, uh, over one million top secret security clearances, over half those one million top secret security clearances uh, being in the hands of uh, private contractors like Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, Blackwater, SAIC, uh, uh, Raytheon, etc. Uh, uh, today it was announced that, with great fa fanfare, uh, that the United States government uh, would be declassifying uh, one of the Pfizer court orders against uh, Verizon. So the Pfizer court, as some of you may know, is a secret court uh, in the United States. Uh, I should not use the word court. Um, uh, it is a, a secret administrative body, uh, which the government calls a court, um, before which uh, applications for surveillance are, uh, are put by the executive and uh, ordered. Uh, it is a way of getting around the separation between uh, powers, between the executive and the judiciary. It's not a real judiciary. It uh, has issued over 1,300 um, uh, orders this year for surveillance, mass surveillance, individual surveillance, uh, and rejected, rejected none. And the uh, decision to uh, publicly declassify one of those uh, bulk surveillance orders, well, which order is it? Uh, it is, in fact, uh, the bulk surveillance order against Verizon uh, that was revealed by uh, Edward Snowden. Uh, what's going on there? Um, it's already public. Uh, why is it a, why is it all at all interesting that it's been declassified? Well, we've seen this uh, in a lot of our other publications, uh, from uh, Guantanamo Bay to uh, parts of the diplomatic cables, that uh, these documents are treated like scriptures, um, and that there's unholy. That, sorry, there's holy scriptures and there are scriptures that are disgraced, uh, that are desecrated. And here we have precisely the same piece of paper, with precisely the same information uh, given to the public, uh, presented before the public, which everyone acknowledges uh, is in fact public, which it's even been acknowledged is in fact um, uh, an order that exists uh, officially. And yet there's another version of it. Uh, that is still holy. 
the classification program and classification czars uh, sprinkled, in effect, uh, holy water, um, 77 million uh, vials of holy water in the United States per year uh, to imbue uh, text, to imbue information with some kind of property, uh, some invisible property uh, that isn't uh, associated with the textual elements of the documents themselves. It is not associated with the intellectual content uh, of these documents. And so we can have holy documents and we can have uh, desecrated uh, documents. And of course, WikiLeaks is in the business of publishing, uh, if you like, desecrated uh, documents where the, the holiness of them uh, has been profaned. And we can see absurd results uh, where the United States government issues orders uh, to, uh, going back even to 2007, to, uh, to its Guantanamo Bay staff. But they cannot look uh, at the Guantanamo uh, Bay manuals published by WikiLeaks, uh, that people cannot look at the cables published by WikiLeaks, uh, that um, no one in the military can look at uh, uh, the documents related to Edward Snowden's uh, disclosures, even though those are the very people who actually have the security clearances uh, to look at those documents. Uh, there is a priestly, cl a priestly class within the new national religion uh, of the United States. Uh, and that priestly class uh, is able to imbue one document or another document uh, with special magical properties. Uh, and it is also able to take back those magical properties. And those adherents of the cult, uh, they are not able uh, to even look at this material. Um, even though all the public is looking at it, it's somehow defiled and profaned and therefore uh, toxic uh, to, to what? Uh, to some spirituality, some uh, executive uh, power structure that is maintained by this illusion. Let's look at the uh, public publication by WikiLeaks of uh, documents from Scientology. Scientology has been going after me and a, a number of, uh, in fact, people at bits of, originators of bits of freedom in the Netherlands uh, for years, uh, in the case of the Netherlands with the, the Fishman affidavits. But what, what was going on there? Well, um, uh, defectors from Scientology uh, squirreled out secret uh, hidden Bibles. Uh, economic description of these secret hidden Bibles is that as you leveled up, uh, in the Scientology uh, system. Uh, that's the information that had restricted supply uh, and Scientology coupled uh, economics to that restricted supply, selling access in effect to these Bibles, which uh, were meant to give you, at least the advertising is concerned, a greater and greater uh, individual mental uh, powers. And of course, it was an economic threat to have them uh, be published. Uh, it was also a political threat because the material is ridiculous. Um, you would have seen uh, perhaps South Park and, that's <clears throat> and its description of OT3 uh, with uh, how the human race was frozen by the evil Lord Zenu, Zenu uh, brainwashed for millions of years uh, and sucked into a volcano in Hawaii and blowing, blowing up, etc. It's just absurd stuff. Uh, but once you're sufficiently indoctrinated into the cult, uh, you don't see it as absurd anymore. But the, the coupling that Scientology placed around uh, its own secret Bibles uh, was that members of the cult, adherents, uh, if they were exposed to that material before they got to their right level, uh, to use analogy, their right classification level, uh, if they were exposed to that uh, through impure channels, uh, then it would kill them. It literally, it would fry their brains. Uh, and so you have um, uh, orders by uh, the leadership of Scientology that no one look at that material. Uh, and that if they do look at it, um, it, will, it will damage them. And so you have uh, adherents of the cult uh, refusing uh, to look uh, at um, unholy or profane material. Uh, similarly, we now have vast sways uh, of the United States security apparatus uh, refusing uh, to look at WikiLeaks in case they are themselves profaned, uh, refusing to look at the Guardian orders uh, uh, in fact, to, to modify firewall rules um, in, the, in the US Army to ban WikiLeaks, long done, of course, but uh, uh, to ban uh, even now um, 
The Guardian has a resource for its co coverage of the Edward Snowden affair. And uh, I find that um, uh, such an interesting description of what is going on that um, there's a, a religious adherence uh, to the view of classification um, and it taps into some uh, pre-existing feeling that human beings have about the, the, the subtle unstated uh, effects uh, of power uh, and of, of loyalty. Um, these are in the end just bits of paper. Even if we look at the law uh, in the United States, what is the law? Uh, well, the, there's the Espionage Act of 1917. It speaks about particular things. It doesn't speak about there's some bureaucrat who's put down a stamp uh, and that makes some, that means anything at all. Uh, it speaks, uh, uh, perhaps in some places quite correctly, about uh, the intentional revealing of information which would uh, cause the United States, uh, whatever that means precisely, a serious harm. Um, it does not speak about has a priest uh, in this new national security religion uh, blessed a document by sticking a stamp on it. Um, that's purely a bureaucratic uh, advisory maneuver. It has no legal meaning other than perhaps you might be able to argue that having seen such a document uh, uh, with, a, with a classification stamp on it, uh, one should be aware that perhaps the document uh, might cause uh, harm or injury to the United States. If there's some sort of uh, advisory uh, notice that someone uh, in, the, in the bureaucracy uh, believes that. But uh, in practice, we're moving well away from that and moving into uh, a transnational security state a religion. It's not just the United States. It's something that's clearly uh, spreading throughout the, the Five Eyes uh, Alliance. Okay, so let's put that aside and ask ourselves the question, um, uh, are there other bodies that are starting to mesh into this uh, global system? Well, I, you know, anyone who's followed geopolitics for a long time understands that um, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, SAG, Boeing uh, have all been completely enmeshed in this, and uh, um, Eisenhower uh, in, in the, uh, the 60s uh, warned, uh, maybe it was 59, warned uh, about the military industrial complex. There was a, a massive con complex in the United States that built up after World War II. Uh, where uh, industries um, took uh, their part in the war effort and were extremely richly uh, rewarded and formed a massive lobby uh, after World War II. Prior to World War II, the United States had 50,000 uh, federal uh, troops. Uh, during World War II, uh, around eight, 8 million and, and after, um, coming down a bit to we see um, between, between 1 and 2 million uh, soldiers uh, Presently, so that that system um, of integrated uh, business and government and state power uh, has been in existence since uh, World War II, but <clears throat> we see a smoothing out uh, now to a degree where even people uh, at this conference are involved in the exploit market uh, of selling uh, weaponized uh, intellectual pro uh, products uh, to these military uh, contractors. You know, back in 2008, I wrote an article, you can search for it now, uh, on WikiLeaks, On the Take and Loving It, which was about how academics uh, rent out their minds to the National Security Agency, uh, whore out their minds. Uh, highly intelligent people have many opportunities in life. Uh, those people who rent out their minds, whore out their minds uh, to abusive, uh, secretive, uh, apparatuses of the national security state. Uh, they do not command our respect, either intellectually, because people uh, who are brilliant have many opportunities in life, or morally, uh, because people who are moral uh, do not whore themselves out uh, to the national security state. Uh, those people in this audience doing that, uh, they should stop it. They should really stop it. That's not a that's not a good thing to do. Um, and uh, I, I don't want to, to morally hector uh, people too much about that, but I mean, that's a really lousy thing to do. Um, 
and perhaps uh, people don't have enough some degree of perspective about what is going on uh, but you know, in the age of the internet uh, ignorance uh, is a, a personal choice. It's a personal choice to not understand uh, what is going on. Okay, let's look at the high-tech companies, uh, Google, Microsoft, and so on, um, that have been uh, sucked into this new national order. Well, were they, were they sucked in or did they voluntarily go? It's a quite interesting question. Um, some of you will have seen that I released a secret interview between me and Eric Schmidt, uh, the CEO of Google, which took place when I was under house arrest back in 2011. What was going on there? Well, there's uh, some information uh, about that that I put in to an op-ed that very interestingly published in the New York Times. It's a, a disturbance in the matrix, as Glenn Greenwell put it, for the New York Times to publish that. But there's other information that wasn't revealed there. Um, as Google became part of the international system, uh, it went from being a culture of Californian uh, graduate students principally, a, a pretty nice uh, open culture, uh, into dealing with the big bad world. Uh, and as Google started dealing with the big bad world, Google itself uh, became big and bad. In order to fight for its corner uh, in China, in new markets, uh, with rivalries uh, with other companies, uh, Google, which knew nothing about geopolitics, uh, looked for friends. Uh, in fact, it had found new friends in the State Department. And those new friends in the State Department, uh, well, they helped, they helped Google out. Um, when Google uh, was experiencing what it says with problems with China, uh, who did it lean on? Uh, well, it lent on the National Security Agency. And the recent book by uh, Eric Schmidt and uh, Jared Cohen about Google, fascinating uh, play. Uh, that book, the um, I can't remember the title of now, uh, uh, is a strategic attack by, the, by Eric Schmidt uh, and the command structure of Google uh, on the traditional US security complex. Uh, the back cover has quotes from uh, Kissinger, from Madeleine Albright, uh, from Clinton, from uh, Hayden, the former director of the National Security Agency and uh, the CIA, uh, and Tony Blair. So a, a raft uh, of... Uh, uh, alleged war criminals, some of the most famous in the world, uh, on the back, inside, the first person thanked uh, is Henry Kissinger. Uh, what's going on? Well, Google's trying to tell Washington that it is the new uh, geopolitical visionary. It is the new Lockheed Martin uh, of the 20th, 21st century. It can uh, tell the American national security complex uh, where should it go next, that it is part of uh, family America. Uh, what is the most optimistic interpretation? The most optimistic interpretation uh, is that Google felt that it was still necessary to do that, uh, that it is not so completely in the tent uh, with old power that it felt a need to undo the zipper uh, to try and uh, climb inside. Well, when Eric Schmidt uh, came to visit me back in 2011, uh, he came with three other people. Who were those three other people? They were all people associated with the State Department. Jared Cohen, uh, who now commands uh, Google Ideas. Effectively, he's in charge of uh, Google's regime change uh, department. That's come out through our cables. You can have a look at him uh, in our cables. You can have a look at him uh, in the Strat4 uh, material. Uh, what was he doing? Well, he was going around uh, into, uh, according to the cables, into uh, Afghanistan and doing things like having meetings with all the Afghan telcos and saying, hey, we think all the base stations in Afghanistan should be put onto US military bases uh, in Afghanistan. The Afghan telcos, three of them refused to meet him. The fourth one said, well, why would you want to do that? And uh, he said, well, increased security um, and convenience. Uh, 
uh, the Afghan telco said, well, the, our only, we don't have any problems with our base stations being blown up. Our only problems are when our maintenance guys uh, send a van to maintain them. Occasionally, the van's uh, hijacked or they get kidnapped. Uh, but we don't think that's really going to improve if they're driving into a uh, US army base. Uh, what was he doing uh, in Lebanon? Well, he was involved in setting up a, uh, a covert think tank, uh, pro-Shia, designed to rival uh, Hezbollah. Uh, what was he doing uh, in the United Kingdom? Well, he was in the United Kingdom meeting with executives from Bollywood, uh, uh, telling them about a special fund uh, that the United States had to modify uh, film programming content uh, in movies to uh, to make movies less hospitable uh, to extremism that might take place against the United States. Uh, and that other, they could be lined up with uh, US uh, movie companies that had uh, used the same system. So that's uh, Jared Cohen. Uh, those of you who have read or seen The Quiet American, uh, he is like that. He is a, a true believer, uh, a, a, a personable guy, now head of uh, Google Ideas. Who else? Uh, Lisa Shields. Who's Lisa Shields? Uh, Lisa Shields, uh, at that time, um, media director for Council for Foreign Relations. Uh, also at that time, uh, Eric Schmidt's lover. Uh, who else? Uh, Scott Malcolmson. Who's Scott Malcolmson? Uh, well, Scott Malcolmson had had previously been a senior advisor to the, to the State Department, and at that time uh, was working, uh, working for Google. Now he's media director uh, of uh, International Crisis Group. What's going on there? Um, all these people. Well, it's sort of an unofficial delegation uh, from, from the State Department. Um, and if we fast forward uh, two months, very, very interesting uh, and indicative event. Uh, I needed to speak to Hillary Clinton, uh, and we needed to do this for a, a careful legal reason and document it. Okay, so uh, I, I know how to play this game. As, as, a, as a journalist, you call up, you get a PA, and you say, this is a person-to-person -person call, and you start elevating through the hierarchy. Can Mr. Assange speak to, uh, speak to Hillary? How are we going to line it up? When, when, what's a good time, et cetera, et cetera. And so we rose through the bureaucracy. Uh, in, in this matter, leveling up closer and closer to Hillary. Uh, and eventually got to one of Hillary's senior legal advisors. Hillary's senior legal advisor uh, said, uh, we'll, we'll call you back, uh, Hillary's in a meeting, etc." cetera. Uh, then what happened? Lisa Shields, Lisa Shields, Eric Schmidt's lover, called one of our people and asked, did I want to speak uh, to Hillary Clinton, confirming that the call was uh, really, really from me. So Lisa Shields, Eric Schmidt's lover, was the back channel. She, she doesn't formally uh, work for the State Department. Formally, she works for the Council for Foreign Relations. So here we have a situation where uh, you call Hillary, you get the chairman of Google's girlfriend as the covert back channel. That's how close uh, Google is uh, injecting itself into family America. It is now spending more money in Washington uh, lobbying than Lockheed Martin uh, is. This uh, uh, structural relationship, uh, this patronage relationship uh, occurring um, at, the, the, um, at the command level of Google uh, shows you that it has been completely uh, sucked into the system. So it's no surprise whatsoever uh, that in 2009 uh, Google took part uh, in uh, the PRISM program. Of course, less surprise to everyone that Microsoft uh, was, was there and, uh, and now that uh, Skype is also sucked in after it was acquired from Microsoft. Um, but we should really understand that there is uh, the creation of a new um, world order that involves principally the deep state, the national security security state as a structuring force uh, and connected into that structuring force, many, many companies and organizations uh, and individuals uh, sucking down uh, an economic gradient or a, or a patronage gradient or an information flow gradient. 
Okay, so is, is there any hope uh, or are we all doomed? Um, well, it's a, it's a pretty interesting question. Uh, you know, Americans uh, hate it when uh, I posit this question because uh, pessimism or cynicism uh, is a taboo uh, in, the in the United States. But I think we really must ask, else, ask else, uh, we really must ask ourselves, uh, is it the nature of technology, the nature of the complex production of technology, that it inherently leads to centralization? Uh, it is, the, is it the nature of networking, of connecting things together, uh, that, uh, that the most powerful object, uh, that the most powerful system of information flow and accumulation, if you start connecting it to everything else, uh, starts to dominate? That's an extremely interesting philosophical question. Uh, any manufacturing uh, of technology which uh, has associated with it volumes, uh, efficiencies of scale, um, uh, complex manufacture, specialization, well, all those things can be lent on uh, by whoever has control uh, of a gun. They can be lent on by whoever has coercive force. Uh, and as a result, um, uh, uh, whoever has coercive force can get more coercive force. It can leverage itself uh, through these, uh, through the relationships uh, that the highest uh, uh, tech uh, companies have. And uh, now we see that uh, we are in, uh, at least most of you will be familiar with the surveillance system and how everything is being connected together there across the Five Eyes alliances and all the NATO nations, etc. cetera. Um, uh, we may finally achieve the dream that uh, uh, some peace activists rather foolishly had after World War II uh, of a one world government where everyone is connected together into the same system of uh, asymmetric uh, power as a result of asymmetric information uh, and information flow and deployment of coercive force. Uh, it seems to me the, the, there is a tendency operating against it. Uh, I don't know which one will win. With, with the halving of bandwidth costs, the halving of uh, storage costs every 18 months, um, we also see effectively uh, the doubling uh, of power of the National Security Agency every 18 months. Uh, on the other hand, there is a new international body politic developing. Uh, this meeting we're having right now is a reflection of that. The increased attendance here uh, compared to four years ago uh, is a reflection of this developing new international body, body politic and a new consensus, a new consensus about values and about what is important. Uh, Edward Snowden uh, is a reflection uh, of that new consensus. Uh, about what is wrong and what is right and how to act. Uh, that new consensus, of course, needs to be uh, transitioned and measured and demonstrated. The political will that is associated with that new international body politic needs to be made manifest uh, for a variety of, of mechanisms that measure it, acts uh, that are important, uh, surveys that we occasionally see where whenever we have some open popularity contest, uh, we see Bradley Manning, uh, I imagine Snowden would now be well on the list, me, WikiLeaks, Anonymous, uh, winning these generalized surveys, uh, not um, uh, other groups. That's a, a fascinating thing to see, uh, a fascinating thing to see that, um, that it is who, uh, if, if you make an open poll, who is it that wins the open polls? It's Western dissidents in the West who win the open polls, rather unsurprisingly. Uh, but it's very rare that they're open. They're often marginalized. Uh, Bradley Manning won Guardian Person of the Year with 70% of the vote. Uh, the Guardian, of course, tried to manipulate and manufacture that poll, but he didn't win. But that is a crushing uh, victory and a crushing uh, reflection uh, of the true will of people uh, to say, this person uh, represents uh, what I believe. This person is a symbol uh, for my hopes and dreams. Uh, and this person is a symbol also uh, in the way that they have been persecuted for all that I despise. Um, the increasing interaction speed that we all have um, is perhaps another mechanism that is going to uh, uh, deal with the transnational surveillance state. Yes, you might be spying on everyone. Yes, there are lots and lots of new algorithms which are developed in deployment algorithms. Uh, but we look at a, hor uh, you know, a horrifying statistic put out by Eric Schmidt. Um, 
that uh, there are a million new uh, Android devices turned on each day for the first time. One million per day turned on for the first time. Uh, in, a, in a few seconds uh, of this talk, this whole auditorium, bang, turned on for the first time. Those people doing free work for the National Security Agency, are doing free work uh, for Google. Imagine uh, if WikiLeaks expanded by a million people per day. Uh, that's the population, more than the population of the United States uh, per year. On the other hand, a million people interacting at speed, new per day. Uh, what is the ability to comprehend and understand and manage that nonlinear interaction of a million people uh, at speed? Uh, that's extremely hard. Um, I think that perhaps explains uh, why uh, the increasing uh, independence of Latin America. Partly, yes, that's to do with the United States uh, and its allies taking its eyes off uh, Latin America and focusing them on uh, the Middle East uh, and China. Uh, but I think some of it is this uh, new fast interaction speed, which even if you're spying on everything, um, doesn't mean you can predict everything because the interaction is happening uh, too fast and it's too dynamic. Um, okay, so I think we're, what, at 40 minutes now? Uh, uh, despite saying that uh, people who sit there and talk for a long time is incredibly boring, I see that I've, I've in fact done that. Um, but okay, so let's uh, cut to questions. Just so Julian can actually see you, we're asking everybody with questions to come over here by the soundboard and line up behind me. Uh, are we guys, are we ready to go? Um, Arian, are you ready to ask the first question? Okay, go. Hi, Julian. Um, just like some of the other great speakers we had uh, earlier today, the only government that you really talked about was the US government, and I completely understand why. But it begs the question, what the 95% of us on this planet who are not Americans, and who would like to keep it that way, can actually do concretely to sort of lower the impact of the US government on our lives. So any ideas you have, very welcome. Thanks. Thank you for that. Well, uh, <clears throat> you're in the Netherlands. Uh, you exist under the US government. That's the reality. Uh, the Danish, sorry, the um, Dutch intelligence services and their relationship with, with the US uh, is a subordinate relationship. Uh, the involvement in NATO, NATO is subordinate. Um, uh, um, there's a question, in fact, with what is happening now in the United States in Congress uh, and this maneuver to, which, which just failed in terms of voting, to uh, decrease uh, the legal ambit of the National Security Agency to conduct uh, bulk warrantless surveillance against people in the United States. Uh, these things are completely doomed to fail. Um, I see uh, strategically um, what's going on as equivalent to the chance of uh, voluntary reduction in nuclear weapons. Uh, look, after the, after the Cold War, uh, we had a situation where it was very, very easy for the United States to voluntarily uh, reduce uh, its nuclear weapons complex. Uh, we had a number of countries asking for that. We had the United States as part of the NPT, the uh, uh, international um, agreement that it would reduce uh, its nuclear weapons to, z to zero. Uh, um, and all parties to the NPT uh, are part of that. Um, we had Hollywood movies uh, and a pretty effective nuclear a pretty strong, rather, nuclear disarmament lobby uh, saying, look, here's a whole lot of people being blown up and killed and the radiation everywhere, etc. Uh, it's something you, you can imagine. Uh, what actually happened with nuclear disarmament? Uh, well, there was about a one-third uh, reduction uh, in arms um, as a result of pressure even from other states. What is the chance that there will be uh, unilateral, uh, voluntary, um, disarmament uh, of the transnational surveillance complex. Well, what, what are the chances that if you had 
nuclear weapons that were not nuclear, that were invisible, uh, that were intangible, uh, and which didn't directly kill anyone, uh, that there would be disarmament. Zero. There will be no disarmament. Uh, it is not going to happen. The transnational surveillance state will not disarm. Uh, it will collect more and more states uh, into its mouth uh, as the world becomes more connected together in information flow and political flow, etc. That's reality. Uh, there are ways of, of operating against it. Cryptography is a very important way of operating against it. Um, politically, of course, we can't just let... Um, you can't give free ground politically. We have to fight politically, of course. Uh, if, you, if you just walk off the field and you give free ground, uh, the free ground will be gobbled up. So there has to be resistance. But it is a fantasy uh, that the transnational surveillance state uh, will ever disarm uh, short of a mass economic collapse, which is possible uh, because politically it's managing to gobble up all the resources. Uh, now, in individual countries, well, of course, I think you should, you should fight for your sovereignty. Uh, of your culture. I think that, that the um, forces of resistance, if you like, which include a number of people on the left, uh, have been paralyzed by the idiocy of transnationalism. Um, Post-World War II and as a result of pressures from the, from the United States, the uh, view that, oh, we're, um, we should uh, all open up, uh, uh, that our, our national governments are not important, and national cultures are not important. What has that led to? Uh, it has led to individual cultures being like white rice. Uh, white rice, and the take upon whatever flavor, uh, the take upon the majority flavor that's pushed into them. And the majority flavor, the majority power in terms of information flow and systems of organizations is the, uh, the transnational system uh, that the United States and Great Britain uh, erected after, after World War II. Uh, so, yeah, I think part of the answer to this question uh, is nationalism. And it's, it's having states recognize, having states recognize that their sovereignty uh, and their power structures are uh, completely undermined. Uh, it's, it's a difficult problem. You have um, um, co-option of all the principal players uh, in the state. The people who have the levers of power uh, in each state are uh, corrupted and co-opted and bribed and blackmailed. Uh, uh, by that system. Uh, so I think actually, um, other than getting individual states concerned about this uh, and forming alliances of states, as we see in Latin America, who, can, who might resist it, um, the only uh, path forward uh, is strong cryptography. It's the, the only hope uh, producing a, effectively uh, a defensive weapon system, a defensive system against bulk state uh, spying, other states who are threatened need to uh, engage and invest in that. As individuals, we need to do that. Corporations who are subject to it also need to do it. So, um, you've been there for uh, quite a while in the embassy. Um, what's your end game to get out of there? Do you have a, a, a plan? You can live there forever? <laughs> you know what? I mean, we can ask this to everyone. What's your end game? In the end, you will die, right? So. Uh, but in the me in, uh, before that happens, before that happens, you might be able to do something that is useful and satisfying uh, and that uh, adheres uh, to your principles uh, and defends the people you care about. Uh, so this is, I'm not trapped in this embassy. I was outside this embassy. I came into this embassy for a very specific purpose uh, to engage geopolitically um, uh, the region uh, of South America. Uh, with this issue, that that has been uh, successful. Um, the, there's $10 million admitted by the British government of surveillance per year uh, outside this embassy. Um, it is a difficult environment, uh, but as we see with uh, Edward Snowden's, um, uh, how will I put it, trip out of Hong Kong, um, that actually there is still some uh, room to maneuver if you're extremely careful and diligent. Hey, Julian, um, I really wish you, you, you'd be around here with us because, you know, it's, it's beautiful. And um, I think that if all of us work hard enough, maybe sometime soon, well, you, Edward Snowden, Bradley Manning, and all of us, you know, could, 
hang around and have fun with lots of lights. And sometimes, well, uh, <laughs> you were right. You were right. And Bradley, Edward, and you shows us, uh, show us every day that courage is actually contagious. Um, I have a question here. Um, take a random hacker with a little bit of talent and a little bit of courage. What she or he could do to help WikiLeaks today, what she or he could maybe contribute to some meaningful free software project that helps the cause of freedom yeah. of speech, freedom of information, and making the world a, a better place. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, those who don't know, Jeremy Zimmerman and La Quadrature Jeanette, uh, one of the people stopped uh, going uh, out from uh, the United States uh, by a pair of S FBI officers and, uh, and effectively asked to become uh, an informer uh, against me. Um, uh, uh, Jeremy, as you see, uh, completely... Beca because I'm your friend, basically. Yeah. Only because I'm your friend. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, no, it's true. Um, uh, asked to become an informer against me. As you see, Jeremy Zimmerman, uh, not at all cowed uh, by that. I think that, that's the uh, first thing to understand. Um, that um, The transnational systems, uh, authority complexes, uh, don't need to have real power. Uh, they don't need to have competence. All they need to do is project an image that makes people scared uh, and that makes them comply. Um, uh, they do that whenever they possibly can. Uh, that is part of something which in critical theory is called securitization, um, which is taking any event and putting it into uh, redefining it in terms of um, the security complex and what that can do. And uh, so that's the first thing. Don't fall for all this bullshit. I mean, um, uh, we have many people here uh, who are not scared. There are people uh, who make mistakes, uh, who are not, caught, who are not uh, sufficiently cautious or extremely unlucky uh, who get embroiled in something. My position here, um, this isn't a result of me sort of making a mistake. This is a very conscious decision uh, uh, way back uh, in 2010 certain things were important to me and that I would do those. Uh, and yes, I was willing to uh, see even WikiLeaks as an organization completely destroyed uh, rather than to not publish. Uh, it's something I thought about very, very consciously. Um, as you see, uh, I'm not in prison. I'm not dead. I'm continuing with our, with our work. We're smashing banking blockades, winning law, uh, lawsuits everywhere, engaging in new publications and uh, you know, the, the serious business that we're engaged in. Um, so first of all, don't, don't fall for the bullshit. Um, uh, these agencies, while vast in terms of their presence uh, and, and surveillance, are deeply incompetent, um, ferociously incompetent. Uh, let's look at Afghanistan, the second poorest country on the earth. Uh, two superpowers, the United States and Europe, uh, have been unable to subjugate the second poorest country on Earth uh, because they are so incompetent that they don't really believe uh, in the mission and so on. Similarly, uh, the United States uh, has been unable uh, to get a hold uh, of Edward Snowden, has sprayed, sprayed out exhibition orders all over the world. Even Ireland, uh, Ireland uh, has rejected uh, those uh, expedition requests. Uh, small Latin American countries have rejected them. So, yes, this overarching system uh, does tend towards a dystopia, but it also tends towards incredible internal uh, incompetence uh, and stupidity. And that's really something uh, you can work with. Now, as, as individual hackers, well, um, you can always give, and that's very important, you can always give WikiLeaks uh, money, uh, information, the people who are associated with us and defend us, money, uh, information, uh, talent, uh, where you can. Um, work on uh, cryptography projects, those are extremely important. I think uh, 
distributed uh, safe uh, chat and messen messaging is uh, perhaps uh, one of the most important things I see that that is evolving now. I've been speaking about it for a while. It is slowly but surely evolving. Um, uh, the Edward Snowden uh, Defense uh, Committee, um, uh, which we've formed, well, it needs a bunch of web programmers and so on. Uh, it's a bit hard to get people in the United States uh, to contribute that, to that. Uh, you can speak to Annie Mahmoud, um and uh, uh, Tom Drake uh, if you want to um, volunteer uh, some labor activity, or uh, uh, Jeremy, perhaps as well, uh, if you want to volunteer uh, programming time uh, or funds. Hi, Julian. <coughs> Big thanks to you and all the people that supported you. And my question is, if you personally could change just three things, what would they be and why? Well, I mean, uh, if, I, if I was, what, what, Supreme Lord Master of the Universe, or is there some, is there some, uh, well, you know, I'd, I'd make everyone infinitely intelligent, infinitely compassionate, and live forever. There you go. Hey Julian, um, I'd just like to echo the sentiments and say thank you for your sacrifice and the sacrifice of many others who've helped you and helped uh, bring the information to light. One of the defense mechanisms of the system seems to be to isolate people like yourself, like Bradley Manning and like Edward Snowden, so that they can then pick on those single people and bring them down. Now, how can we get back to this being about the information and not about the people? Because the information is what's important, getting the information to the masses and then the people will become unimportant as the information gets out there. Yeah, well, it's, you know, uh, at the base level, uh, if, you, if you can't argue with the fa if you can't play the mat, sorry, if you can't play the ball, uh, to use an Australian phrase, you play uh, the man. Uh, you engage in ad hominem attacks to try and divert, uh, divert the discussion. Uh, we've seen that with me, we've seen that with Bradley Manning, uh, we've seen that with Gwen Greenwell, we've seen that with Edward Snowden, and many other cases. Uh, we saw it, uh, those who've read your history books, uh, with Nelson Mandela, uh, who was absolutely demonized as a terrorist. He couldn't even go uh, to the United States until uh, 1998. Uh, he was banned uh, from, from travel. You know, those things uh, tend to fall away after a while. Um, um, but Let's look at it in another way. Um, the world is complex, um, and therefore people need uh, symbols to uh, stand for things. Um, every word that we use, in fact, uh, is a cognitive symbol. Uh, all apples are different to each other, but we have the word apple to abstract the appleness away and provide a symbol. Um, similarly, uh, me, Bradley Manning, uh, Edward Snowden, uh, we are symbols for something. Uh, symbols for something that, is, that are quite important. Um, now, the fate of Edward Snowden, um, conceptually, uh, that is a referendum uh, on the National Security Agency. Everyone understands that. Uh, uh, Edward Snowden uh, and those who support him are going to win uh, in terms of his liberty and how he is perceived, uh, or they're going to lose. Uh, and if he wins, and that's somehow clearly related to popular support. Um, that is a symbol, an answer to, okay, that this, this thing was uh, unacceptable. Uh, if he loses, uh, that is a symbol for, okay, uh, perhaps the majority force um, uh, is opposed to him. So it is actually quite important uh, to defend uh, and support um, symbols uh, and symbolic organizations because the world is so complex. Um, hi, Julian. Um, just what you said before about uh, religion during your talk made me think of a uh, story being told. So the story that's being told uh, that mankind needs more surveillance and more security, etc., uh, to avert some harm. Um, so if that's actually a harmful story, what kind of story would you propose to tell that is more beneficial? And yeah. Uh, so what you're saying, what we need the we need the new uh, biblical stories uh, of our of our age, 
uh, new national security religion has a whole lot of, yeah, of uh, biblical stories now uh, that it, it, it goes around. Uh, uh, what the NSA can walk on water, I suppose, uh, something like that, uh, to save uh, to save everyone from the devil, uh, uh, which is terrorists, or Osama bin Laden, these mythical figures uh, arising from the desert. Um, yeah, so I agree. We need, we need a new story to uh, pull people together. People need to understand and have hope. Um, I said before that there is a dystopia rushing towards us. On the other hand, there's a very interesting new dynamic of a new political estate uh, and a new collection of values that is arising as a result of the internet, the period of unparalleled mass uh, political education uh, and sharing of knowledge, the likes of which the world has never seen. It has never seen something like that. Um, and as a result, um, uh, an empowerment and emancip emancipation uh, of a variety of um, different groups, uh, of which even this conversation is a part of, uh, the Pirate Party, uh, um, uh, the WikiLeaks Party, which is now running for elections uh, in, in Australia. Um, I think ultimately um, the mindset that comes from that new international body politic uh, uh, is such that you cannot hire a technical person that has not been educated on the internet. In fact, you cannot hire an educated person now, a newly educated person that hasn't been widely exposed uh, to, the, to the values um, and uh, knowledge and political understanding uh, that comes out of the internet. Um, I think that is a, a great hope. Um, uh, it remains to be seen how this uh, conflict works out. That's what makes it so fascinating and so interesting uh, that we have this, you know, there's a sound that is echoing uh, all around at the moment. And that sound is the sound of the clash of the rising power uh, of these two forces, this new international body politic um, and the transnational security state. These things are clashing together. Um, and we hear that sound. Uh, hello. Uh, I have a very simple question. I would like to know how you analyze the fact that the accusation against Bradley Manning of intelligence with the enemy was finally abandoned. Was it the step that the American administration could not take at that time? Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite interesting as to what uh, went on there. Um, first of all, uh, I see that that charge is largely as a red herring. Um, he started with 22 charges. Uh, he went down to 20. Uh, he's facing 136 years. Uh, the aiding the enemy charge uh, would have given him life. He's not going to live uh, 150 years uh, anyway. Um, so that's, uh, you know, uh, if he was 80, he would still have, what, 70, over 70. Um, years and still left to serve, in theory. That's not going to happen. It's going to collapse down as a result of a strong campaign by us and his defenders. Um, but uh, I think that it was put there as a sort of amber claim, as, you know, uh, let's see how far we can go. We want to constantly push the envelope. Um, already a very, very serious uh, five uh, counts of espionage for what everyone agrees is a journalistic source. There was no evidence produced in the trial that any harm, any harm at all, uh, came to any person uh, as a result uh, of our publications. Uh, none at all. Uh, it was not claimed, it was not alleged, uh, it was not proven. Um, uh, there's no uh, accusation that he uh, was involved with a foreign power. None at all. Uh, no evidence was adduced that he was. Uh, and yet we have five charges for espionage. Uh, that is a very serious, bold a new pushing of the envelope um, by uh, the security complex in the United States. Uh, it wanted to go even further uh, with this aiding the enemy charge. It's a, it's a victory, yes, that that's knocked out. It means he can't be sentenced for life. That's quite important. Um, but I think this was always a completely, utterly absurd uh, amber claim. Hey. 
Um, I wanted to ask uh, your, your point of view on um, these times that we are living. As in, uh, I think that this time is sort of a showdown where everybody is now aware of the fact that global surveillance is happening and that whistleblowers are being harassed and prosecuted. And I feel that um, you know, everybody knows what is happening. However, um, you know, my, my greatest fear is that people know of this and they decide that it's not important and that they do not care and that it is acceptable that surveillance happens on such a global scale. And I fear that if people actually you know, say that and, and acknowledge that fact, they will you know, have made this choice and this choice will be the choice that we have to stick with. So how do we make sure that people care about this and that this choice does not get made now. Yeah, it's 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 hard. Um, I, you know, I've often said that people are not uh, apathetic. People are powerless because they're apathetic. They're apathetic because they're powerless. Uh, I, I see that most people don't perceive a way that they can meaningfully uh, engage to resist this. Uh, they're wrong. That's a matter of of education. Uh, it's also a matter of us to provide. Uh, more mechanisms that people can meaningfully engage. It's also a matter of, um, you know, keeping, for God's sakes, keeping things in perspective. Um, I've seen so many attacks on me, on our, on our organisation, uh, on people who help our, have helped our organisation, not from uh, the Pentagon. We're, we have faced those down. We face down every single demand that the Pentagon has made for us to destroy publications and so on. Uh, but by uh, opportunists, local opportunists, uh, looking for local uh, political opportunity, by uh, absurd uh, competition uh, within uh, the activist community. We have to go, what side of the goddamn line uh, are you on? Are you on this side of the line or are you on that side of the line? Uh, make your mind up, because if you don't show clear adherence to what side of the line uh, you're on now, um, what's going to happen? What's going to happen when things uh, get even worse? You know, how, can you be trusted at all? Um, and I think that's very important. Uh, that, um, well, of course, we always need uh, some form of intellectual uh, self-criticism. Um, that uh, uh, it's all always uh, in conflicts. Uh, unity is everything, and coherency uh, is everything. Um, and the most unified group uh, that has the tools to unify it. Um, and the uh, wherewithal uh, to unify itself wins um, is the National Security Agency and the mechanisms that it uses uh, to unify itself. Uh, co coercive power and information flows. Uh, is that a more unified group uh, than the resistance? Uh, well, actually, pretty clearly it is more unified. On the other hand, it's pretty incompetent. Uh, there's not much passion there. Um, it lacks flexibility, it lacks speed. Um, so I would um, say that that's something that's extremely important. Let's not uh, be engaged in constantly kicking own goals. Uh, we can't, I mean, we just cannot go that, down that line and expect to uh, succeed at all. Dear sir, thank you for all your answers. There are many answers left, uh, but I wish you much of speech, space, and freedom in your head and physical. Thank you. Thank you. We have more. I could go for more. That, that would be the last question. No more questions. I could go for more. Come on. Do we have? Do we have a? One more question. That is, the, as a personal experience of mine, is that when I speak to other people about problems in this world, is that, well, a lot of them seem to have the opinion that it's worth it to sacrifice your privacy. Um, to gain extra security from crime or other kinds of wrongdoing. And, well, my, 
I don't have a clue how to convince those people who seem to make up a great um, part of the uh, masses that we need to convince in order to uh, do anything about it. So well, how, yeah. well, how if do you suppose we convince those people? Thank you. Uh, well, if they're American, it's a good place to start. Uh, so you believe we should repeal the Fourth Amendment. Okay. It's, it's quite easy. We should just scrap the Fourth Amendment then because the Fourth Amendment uh, uh, says that um, there should not be uh, 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 searching and seizure uh, of people's information or assets uh, or property uh, without proper due process. Um, but if, if we look at a less uh, instrumentalist version, uh, it's fine, actually. Um, crime is a problem. It is a problem. Uh, and yeah, sure, uh, uh, state surveillance structures uh, reduce crime, uh, anonymity increases crime. Uh, that's true. Um, similarly, uh, for those nations that are threatened by, being, by invasion, like uh, Cuba uh, and Iran, um, of course, they have to defend themselves against invasion. Uh, and the result is oppressive uh, apparatuses uh, build up inside to defend themselves from those sorts of attacks. Um, so I think we should start out sort of recognizing um, the position uh, and then go, yeah, but uh, the propaganda about um, terrorist attacks and, and uh, crime is vastly disproportionate to the reality. Um, uh, and that it's not always a trade-off between these two things. Uh, there's many areas where there is no trade-off. Uh, and finally, but most importantly, um, if the state is out of control, uh, it is an armed gang. I mean, if, if you want to look into the theory of how states arrive, uh, they are mafias. Uh, they are small regional band groups of bandits uh, who start extracting concessions from the population. Uh, groups of bandits band together and able to defeat smaller groups of bandits, and that's what, in the end, forms a state. Uh, they are uh, protection rackets that shake people down uh, in what would be traditionally called ties and we, what we now call tax. Um, but when the state goes bad, the amount of crime that is inflicted on you as an individual is tremendous. Uh, and uh, there's often nowhere for your family to, to hide uh, or, or to deal with that. So uh, it is the extreme potential for crime uh, and terror uh, and coercive force uh, being misapplied that we need to watch out for. In the US justice system, that's already happening. I mean, uh, the US federal justice system uh, is uh, one of the worst things that exist uh, on Earth as a sort of debauchery of, of uh, the way human beings uh, should treat each other. A, a grand jury, if you were before a grand jury, there is a 99.97% .97 chance that you will be indicted. 99.97. Uh, if you are indicted, there is a 99% chance you will be convicted. 99%. Uh, that is not um, a judicial system. Uh, that is rule by decree uh, uh, with those sorts of statistics. So there's something where we already see um, when a state has too much central power, uh, it doesn't have to negotiate its power with this population. There is no quid pro quo with the population. Hello, Julian. Uh, I'm glad uh, you're in good shape. Uh, I've seen you four years ago, uh, though you're um, somewhere else tonight. Um, I have a question regarding your um, run in Australia. I heard an interview uh, one week ago, I think it was, from ABC Australia. Uh, it looks as if the political system there uh, doesn't want another party. <laughs> so uh, do you think you have chances uh, there? Yeah, well, <clears throat> what, what existing establishment wants uh, encroachment on its territory? Well, no, none. Uh, but actually, uh, we have amazing figures. Um, for the past year and a half, opinion polls have been done by UMR Research. It is the government's own polling agency, and they show uh, that I have between 25 
than 28% of the vote consistently uh, nationwide across Australia. And of course, at actual election time, that will reduce because people um, revert to their existing habits. But that is not support figures. The support figures are in 60 to 80 percent. That is voting intention, 25 to 28 percent of the population. For WikiLeaks as a party, it's 20 percent uh, uh, nationwide average. And those are repeated again and again, completely consistent, even across different polling companies. Um, so actually, we are the, of, uh, we are the leading uh, party. Uh, other than the uh, three existing uh, parties, uh, three existing big parties, um, the Conservatives, uh, the La Labor uh, and the Greens. And um, actually the Greens is an interesting question whether in some areas uh, we might be surpassing uh, the Greens in that polling. Uh, and importantly, if, if, we, if we look at um, voting intention of people under the age of 40, uh, it's 40%. That's something very interesting is going on. 40% of the Australian population, their voting intention uh, is to vote for me. Yes, they want to in part defend an Australian who's been badly treated uh, by the Australian government. Um, but uh, to such a degree, uh, across so many different, um, different aspects, I see that as uh, the future international body politic. The people under the age of 30 are the most educated uh, by the internet. Uh, they are the most educated full stop. That's the most educated generation the world has ever seen. Uh, and as a result of its education and understanding and its ability to look through the bullshit uh, being provided by the establishment press, um, we see 40% of the vote. Hi, Julian. Uh, I wanted to ask you for clarification on something that you said. Uh, which is that nationalism would be part of our defense. Um, and I mean, I remember having a similar thought watching Edward Snowden try to find a safe harbor that it's good, uh, even though the countries he considered obviously have their uh, problems and are still to be criticized, uh, that the whole world is not yet under US behest and orders. Uh, but I still can't square the word uh, nationalism with, you know, our global movement of hackers meeting up here. So could you maybe clarify a little bit on the extent that you're referring to that? Yeah, they're, they're, in, um, they're in conflict, aren't they? I agree that uh, um, a transnational culture uh, and national cultures are in conflict. I mean, the problem we're, we're having with the transnational order is, as you can see, it is uh, not a, an order of all of us. Uh, it is an order um, of essentially the, for the Anglo-Saxon states uh, put together and then foisted on occupied Europe. Um, and have now feathered out to other domains. Um, let's look at the G20. It's meeting in Russia in September. Uh, in fact, the pressure point uh, for Edward Snowden and his relationship with Russia comes about as a result of the G20 and Obama meeting just a few, few days beforehand. Let's look at the G20. The G20 are the most economically power, powerful states in terms of uh, yeah, purchasing parity and equivalents and so on. Um, of the G20, uh, who are the independent states, that are, we can reasonably say are independent. Uh, well, there's perhaps Argentina, um, uh, Russia, China, um, maybe a little bit, although it's, it is pretty much all into the US system, Indonesia. Uh, and that's it, uh, just four uh, out of the G20. The G20 got all the power. That's a pretty worrying uh, a pretty worrying statistic. Um, well, I think let's let's push it further. And those of you who have read my introduction to cypherpunks, uh, which is on crypto, and you can see it, um, uh, will understand what it means to push it further. Um, well, our new society, our new international body politic, that em emerges very naturally as a result of this transnational interaction that we're all having on the internet, as a result of seeing through the bullshit, as a result of sharing information with each other about what the bullshit is. Um, well, it's a bit like a new culture. Uh, the question is, what defends this new culture? Uh, does it have uh, an army to defend it? Does it have um, governmental structures to defend it? Can, can it find some other way to, be f to free itself as a result of the interference uh, by other state structures or transnational state structures? I mean, pushing things forward 
uh, it's a new body politic that has arisen on the internet has to declare independence. Uh, it has to get to that stage where it can declare uh, independence in a practical sense, um, where its uh, where its structures uh, and uh, it, its own internal history uh, is not subject uh, to the domination uh, by other structures. Um, we're getting there bits and pieces. Other things are also being stolen away as a result of centralization. Um, so I think that's quite an important battle. If we can, if we can build those structures and keep them there, uh, then this new international uh, consensus uh, that we have about what is important and what is right, um, then we can hold it up. And that will provide some kind of counterweight. Um, it's, it remains to be to seen the degree, uh, of course, in, in the cases of, of say, uh, Edward Snowden and a number of other organizations, um, a, f a, few, a few very uh, committed people can actually make a big difference. Um, arguably, they're the only thing that ever has.